Hey everyone, it's Mark from Flight Sim School. Today we're wrapping up our look at VFR navigation and when to use NavAids to help you find your way. And we're going to spend most of our time looking at how to find the airport and get lined up for landing. We're going to be flying three legs today and we're starting off by flying to the airport in the town of Banning and we'll be using our good old compass and chronometer technique that we learned in the previous video for this so we won't spend much time on that at all. The next leg from there though is heading into the Coachella Valley and even though there are a few landmarks that we could use for that leg, we're going to pretend there isn't anything else around for the purposes of the video just so we can fly that leg with a VOR. And then from there, our last leg is going to be all about tips on how to find airports when flying VFR. And we're going to look at how to get down to the right altitude to line yourself up for landing as well. Let's not get too far ahead of ourselves, though. So our first leg for today is on a heading of 066 from our current waypoint that we just went by. And that's why we're turning to that heading right now. And if you need a refresher or you missed the last video where we covered how to create and read an avlog, make sure that you check it out. I'll have a link to it in the description for you, but it'll explain everything that we're doing right now. Now, once we reach the end of this leg, we're going to be flying directly to the Palm Springs VOR. I tend to fall back on VORs for VFR flying anytime that I'm venturing further away from civilization, be it in the mountains or anywhere that there aren't any towns or roads that I can use, because it's going to be a lot harder to find a landmark that's going to work for traditional VFR navigation like we saw in the previous video. And even if you did find one, it might be really far from your last waypoint, which isn't great either. Now, although we're going to be using a nav aid, this doesn't mean that we're suddenly doing an IFR flight. All of the rules that we saw in the previous video about staying out of the clouds, looking out the windows to see where we're going, and everything else still applies. We're just using the VOR on this particular leg because it'll make it easier to find our way. Ironically though, VORs are stations that are physically on the ground. So in a way, it's a bit like using a ground landmark to find your way. The difference being that it's going to tell us which direction we need to fly to get to it, as well as how far away we are from it. So it's going to be a lot more precise than our chronometer and our compass. We're going to do a little bit of setup now for that VOR leg, just because it takes a bit of time to explain everything. And one thing that I find is if you understand how an ILS works, learning VORs isn't too bad because it's really just an extension of the same concepts. First off, we're going to tune the frequency of the station we're going to be flying to into the NAV1 radio. In our case, that's the Palm Springs VOR, which is on 115.5. So I'm going to use the dials that are right here to set that into the standby frequency, and then I'll swap it in so that it becomes our active frequency that we're using. Next comes the slightly more complicated part, and that's figuring out what course we're going to fly to the VOR from our next waypoint. So to get us started, we'll start by just switching the HSI into VOR mode by pressing the CDI key until it turns green and it says VOR1 in the middle. The green arrow is what we manipulate to tell the plane what course we're going to fly across the ground. And if we look at our route in Navigraph, we can see that from banning out to the VOR, the course is 087. We can also calculate that from our navlog that we created with Sky Vector in the last video. But instead of using the magnetic heading, which is adjusted for wind, we're going to have to calculate it by hand by taking the track from one point to the other, which is 098, and then add the variance, which is minus 11, and that'll give you the same course of 087 from point to point. So what all of that means is that we need to turn our course knob until the green arrow is pointing at 087. And the other part of the HSI, which is the green needle that's moving around as we change our course here, that's there to tell us where our course is relative to the airplane. And the easiest way to think of it is to imagine that it's the magenta line that you're used to. Right now, it's telling us that the 087 course that we told it that we want to fly is somewhere to the left of the airplane. So if I bring up our route, we can see that that makes sense because the 087 course extends out from the VOR all the way out to our next waypoint and even beyond that. 
Now we're already flying on a heading of 066 towards Banning. So we're already on a track that's taking us closer to the 087 course. And as we get closer to the waypoint, the course needle is going to continue to move more towards the center where our airplane is. And in fact, when we're right over the waypoint is where the needle and the airplane should overlap because we're going to be right on course. I haven't talked all that much about this current leg of the flight because it was exactly like we saw in the previous video where we were using our compass and our chronometer to calculate where we are. And it was more important to set up the next leg properly because it's going to be a little bit different. But at this point, we are pretty much there because the airport is just off our wing here. And if you've been watching the needle of the HSI as we've been flying towards Banning, you'll have noticed that it's been slowly inching closer and closer to the center and it's almost right on top of our airplane now. So at this point, we're pretty much ready to turn to a heading of 087 as well so that we can fly our direct course to the VOR. The next question you might be wondering about is how we're going to know when we've actually reached the station. And for that, we can bring up the DME by going into the PFD options, and that'll show us how far away we are from the waypoint at any given moment in time. We're just about 16 miles out from the VOR right now, and there's actually another way that you can tell when you're coming up on a VOR as well, and we'll see that in just a couple minutes time. The next thing that we have to deal with, though, is the needle on the HS side. It's very slowly starting to drift off to the right, and that can happen for a few different reasons. Either we didn't roll out on course on time and we're slowly falling off the 087 course that we told it we want to fly, or it's the winds that are blowing us off course. To correct for the drift, it's exactly like with an ILS. And since the needle is off to the right right now, I'm going to turn to the right by about 10 degrees or so, which should get us going in the right direction. And since we're only a little bit off course, it won't take too long to get back to the center again either. Once it does start to slowly trickle back to the center, I can turn the plane back to our original heading of 087. But if it's winds that are blowing us off course, you need to adjust for that because otherwise you're going to end up correcting the flight path the whole way to the VOR. We've got a bit of a quartering tailwind right now from the right. So to make sure that we stay on course, what I could do instead of flying the 087 heading that we're on is set ourselves up to fly the 089 or 090 heading just to compensate for the wind. And then I can adjust as needed to see what it takes to keep the line right at the center of the HSI. We've still got a bit of time before we reach the VOR though, and our next leg once we get there is actually going to be our last one to get to the airport where we're going to land. And this is probably the most challenging part of a VFR flight because you have to time your descent, look for the airport, and line yourself up with the runway all at the same time. Let's start by figuring out what direction we're going to fly. If we go back to our nav log, we can see the airport is on a magnetic heading of 122 from the Palm Springs VOR, and it's about 10 miles from one point to the other. So we'll need to keep that in mind for our descent calculation as well. To spot the airport, we can, of course, use our timer to have an idea when we'll be in the vicinity. But on top of that, it's important to have an idea of where it is relative to other landmarks in the area and what the layout of the airport actually looks like, too. The main thing that sticks out to me here is its location relative to the highway. That'll give us a really good indication of where to look for the airport. The runways are basically parallel to the highway as well, though, so it might actually be hard to spot it for that reason. There are a couple more things that we can do to help us find the airport, but we'll see that as we're flying it in just a bit. The next thing that we need to sort out, though, is when to descend. And for a VFR flight like this, I tend to keep it super simple with some rough math and the 3 to 1 roll. We're cruising at 5,500 feet right now, so if we take our first digit of that altitude and multiply it by 3, that tells us that we need to start our descent at 15 miles from our destination. How fast we're going to make that descent is going to depend on our ground speed, which we can get pretty easily in the Kodiak on the multifunction display. And if we divide that number by two and then add a zero to it, it's going to give us our descent rate that we should use. That gives us 900 feet per minute, and we should actually be starting down now since we're about 15 miles out right now. But I'm going to wait until we go past the VOR so we can see how to adjust if we do end up coming in too high for whatever reason.
our DME is also inching closer and closer to the VOR now. And what's going to happen any second here is the needle is going to start deflecting either to the left or the right again. But it's not because we're off course this time. It's just that as you get closer to the VOR, the needle gets more sensitive and eventually it's going to disappear entirely because we're losing the signal because we're right over the station. So this is the other way that you can know once you've reached a VOR, if you don't have a DME on board or if the VOR doesn't have a DME. And this is also going to be our cue to change our heading to fly our next leg towards the airport, which we saw is on a magnetic heading of 122. I should have also started the timer at this point so we could use it to have an idea when we're going to be in the vicinity of the airport with our navlog data, but I totally forgot to do it. And the other thing that we also need to start at this point is our 900 foot per minute descent that we calculated. The only problem though is that we're less than 10 miles from the airport now according to our navlog and we were supposed to start down at 15 miles out, but we're going to see how to deal with that in just a little bit. First, I just want to focus on how to find the airport. Smaller grass or dirt fields can be especially hard to spot. So what I do is just keep flying the magnetic heading for as long as my navlog says, even if that means flying over the airfield first to identify it properly. If you've got an autopilot in the plane you're flying, then use it to hold your heading and your descent rate because it can be hard to get it all trimmed out properly at the same time as staying on the right heading and looking for the airfield and it just frees you up that little bit more so that you can focus on finding the runway. Once you have finally spotted the runway, there are a bunch of different ways to get yourself lined up for final, but at the end of the day, all you need is just very basic math to figure out how to align yourself so that you're parallel to the runway that you want to land on. In some situations, that might mean flying over the airfield first if you identify it at the last second so that you make sure that you're looking at the right thing. And then you'll want to fly past it for another 30 to 45 seconds and then change your heading so that you're parallel to the runway. Or if you spot it well ahead of time, you can turn to your parallel heading once you make out the runway clear enough, which is going to be our case here today. Other than a few exceptions with airports that have only one way in or out, in general you want to land into the wind as much as possible, which we have on our navlog. And it looks like it's blowing from 263 at 11 today, so that means we're going to target runway 28 for landing. So once we're the right distance from the runway, we'll need to turn to the reciprocal heading, which is what's going to keep us parallel to it. And it's really just the other side of the same runway. And you can calculate that easily for 280 because it's just subtracting 180 degrees from 280. It's going to give you 100. But for other headings, say something like 240 or 05, you can use the plus 2 minus 2 trick, which basically means adding or subtracting 2 from the first two digits of the heading to just really easily calculate the reciprocal in your head. We can clearly see the runway that we're landing at here, but there is a problem. We are way too high because we started our descent past where we should have, but there is an easy way to deal with that, and it's just to do a 360 degree descending turn. So we'll effectively end up in the same spot that we are at the start of the turn, but much lower. You want to try and keep your situational awareness as you're descending and turning though. So again, the autopilot is your friend here. And like that, you can keep an eye on the airport and your altitude. To just figure out if you're going to be at the right altitude to level off or if you need to continue for a second 360 degree turn. In our case, it seems to have done the trick to get us close to a thousand feet above the airfield, but it's still hard to make out the runway. So I'm going to keep heading towards the airfield for just a little bit longer. It's tough to judge distance between your plane and the runway when you're just getting started. So for a high wing plane like this one, I try to have the runway be about halfway up when you're looking out the side window. And if you're in a low wing plane, you're going to want the airport to be just off your wingtip, which should be about the same distance either way. Once you're parallel to the runway threshold that you're going to be landing on, you can start the timer for one last time if you want, or just check the clock so that you know how long you've been flying past the end of the runway. This is going to impact how much time you give yourself on final. So if you're just getting started with VFR flying, going into an airport that you're not familiar with, I find flying 30 to 45 seconds past the end of the runway to be just about right. 
Obviously, depending on the location and terrain, you might have to make that shorter, but doing it this way gives you plenty of time to turn around, spot the runway, and adjust your descent rate accordingly so that you can make a nice stable approach. As you gain experience, you'll start to know your airplane better that you're using for this and how much time you actually need on final to set up for landing. And at that point, you'll want to try and tighten up your traffic pattern as much as possible and try to make it consistent from one flight to the other. Once you're ready, you can start your last two turns of the flight and try to look out the window to align yourself with the runway as much as possible. Although if you took my recommendation, you should have plenty of time. If you want a little bit more detail on how to plan your traffic pattern and straight in approaches, I've covered both of them in detail in the past and I'll leave links to those for you right here. And if you got some value from this video, please like the video and subscribe as well so you don't miss out on the next one.